In 1958, Lloyd Cox was appointed as the Foundation Professor of the University of Adelaide's Obstetric and Gynaecology Department, established at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Cox worked in New Zealand and the UK, and his vision was for the department to be a world leader. His belief that science and medicine should collaborate closely established the foundations for future success. Cox had already indicated in a very strong way his interest in having a science-based department because when he set up the department, he for went one of his clinical positions and gave it to a, my predecessor, Ron Cox, um, an organic chemist, and uh, that was unusual. There was no, I can't, I don't know of another university department that had ever done anything like that. He had to be a, the leader in a lot of disciplines in obstetrics and gynecology at that time. He was the reference center, I suppose, for uh, a lot of work, cancer work and uh, good obstetrics and good gynecology, etc. He had a sense of discipline, certainly in his own life, and uh, I suppose he expected that of his staff as well. He encouraged people to, to look at new ideas and perhaps develop new techniques if, if he thought it was appropriate. He described the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology as, as somewhere where uh, failed surgeons came to practice. He wanted Obstetrics and Gynecology to be a science-based department. The culture of collaboration that Lloyd Cox established has been successfully implemented and continued under successive leaders. It is a vital ingredient to the research breakthroughs of the department and the Robinson Institute. The huge strength of this discipline has always been the great interaction between scientists and clinicians. Clinicians need basic science and the basic scientists need clinicians to see how to translate their research into effective clinical practice. Well, I think that was the strength of the department as well, that you had people who were very, very good obstetricians who were delivering babies, delivering twins, with people who were often generating twins and triplets. What scientists and clinicians were doing at the Queen Elizabeth in terms of creating new life had consequences for the obstetricians at the Queen Victoria who were delivering that, uh, those babies. Working with scientists is a wonderful additional discipline to a clinician. I mean, you couldn't get away with bullshit, if you like. You, know, you had, and if you made a statement, it was exposed and torn apart. And I think this was one of the things I enjoyed in the department. I've always thought it was a privilege to listen to other people's presenting research they've done. During the 1960s, the department thrived in research that helped develop a strong understanding of the factors influencing the female reproductive cycle. Areas such as ovulation induction, developing blood hormone assays and cervical cancer were researched, as well as establishing cervical screening services. In 1967, with the appointment of Malcolm Simons, the department gained a presence at the Queen Victoria Hospital. Bob Seamark was appointed in 1969. He played a key role in one of the most significant breakthroughs in reproductive science. This demonstrated the close link between animal research and its translation into human health. I remember very well being at a, a clinical meeting where we were discussing clinical issues and one that was raised at the time was of a, the husband of one of our patients who was, had testicular cancer and was going to be treated for testicular cancer, which in those days meant there was a strong prospect of him losing his fertility. And I asked a simple question as to why we just didn't freeze semen. We were using it in the cattle industry but it had never been developed for humans. So Colin Matthews came up to me after that meeting and, and said, uh, what would it take for you to develop freezing? This was the first time uh, when we established this semen bank that it uh, had been in a non-clandestine way and indeed uh, in a public hospital. 
which wasn't um, particularly attractive to the administrator of the hospital. And I remember him ringing me up in gynecology saying, Matthews, what the hell are you doing? Uh, and I tried to explain and, and he slammed down the phone on me and said, I think it's disgusting. And so I had to have uh, Lloyd Cox go down and sort him out. <laughs> It did bring the men into the clinic because for the first time, infertility was not a female problem. In 1971, having perfected the technique for freezing semen, a semen bank was established at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, the first in Australia and only the second in the world. In addition, the first donor insemination program was developed. These advances led the department to a pioneering role in the development of the science around male infertility, andrology. In 1973, the department expanded its reach to have a presence at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Alistair MacLennan joined the department in 1977 as a senior lecturer. Coming from the UK, Alistair found the approach towards childbirth somewhat outdated. When I arrived at the Queen Victoria Hospital, I did feel I was going back 10 or 20 years. Women were put in a wheelchair when they came in, to, in labor and told they're invalids, not well women. The husband was taken away to a smoke-filled room and not allowed to see his wife. All the staff wore masks, so it was hard for the patient to recognize who was caring for her. Uh, the doors had little spy holes like prison cells. And then their babies were taken away from them for 24 hours if they were healthy babies, 36 hours if it had been a forceps, and 48 hours if it had been a caesarean section. So there wasn't much bonding going on. Big moves were afoot in obstetrics internationally, and especially the treatment of infertile couples. In 1978, the first IVF baby, Louise Brown, was born in England. Professor John Kerrin was leading research efforts in Adelaide and was instrumental in establishing the first IVF program in South Australia in 1979. There was an entrepreneurial spirit in the department, with money used from its endocrine research fund and the sperm donor program to finance much of its research. The formula was simple. We gained revenue and then we ploughed that profit, I suppose you'd call it, back into the department, into research. It was a sort of cycle which uh, enhanced itself. It was something we tacitly agreed, I think, without ever, you know, without ever making it obvious. And it, and it was really important for us to, uh, as a linking mechanism, yeah. I, I guess we had a public um, service mentality. We weren't too interested in uh, trying to make a lot of money from private practice. So uh, we were interested in, in underpinning the department to, and advancing the research. That gave us our kicks, I suppose. The 1980s saw the advancement of human IVF techniques with Australia becoming a world leader. The department was the first in Australia to create genetically modified livestock and undertake embryo cloning in sheep and cattle. After Lloyd Cox retired in 1984, Arnold Gillespie acted as head of the department. In 1986, Geoffrey Robinson was appointed. He had trained in the UK, including at Oxford University. Yeah, we were delighted that we were able to attract Geoffrey Robinson to the department after Lloyd left. His reputation was huge because he was recognised as not only being an outstanding obstetrician, but uh, I knew him to be an outstanding scientist, so the combination was irresistible. I think Geoffrey's tenure was marked by recruitment of outstanding people, and his judgement in that was pretty much impeccable, I think. I don't say that because he brought me. <laughs> I think if you look at people like Rob Norman, Caroline Crowther, um, many others, it really showed great judgment, but also the respect he was held in worldwide to bring people from all over the world. At, at that point, really, it was a tremendous amount of um, uh, new knowledge and improved treatments around 
uh, conception, uh, the development of some of the first uh, really effective methods for in vitro fertilisation, assisted reproductive technology. But at the same time there was a lot of fundamental work going on into pregnancy um, underlying processes and why we saw some of the most common pregnancy complications. Geoffrey Robinson says his biggest achievement was attracting the right people to the department at the right time. But his pioneering research also continues to have an impact decades later. Julie Owens and I started working together on fetal growth restriction and we provided a comprehensive description of what happens when placental growth is restricted. And that's a common condition in human pregnancy. And we described that in an experimental animal, the sheep, and we showed that this was how a fetus adapted to such a constraint. We demonstrated subsequently some of the longer term consequences of that in experimental animals. Uh, later, uh, when Jody Dodd was writing a strategic paper on future directions for research in obstetrics and gynaecology, I suggested the topic to her of obesity as we clearly recognised it was rising rapidly in our community of pregnant women in South Australia. It was becoming a worldwide problem and it was worthy of investigation. In the 1980s, the department's work included research on menopause and uterine receptivity. South Australia's first birth from a frozen embryo was also achieved by the department in 1985. In 1987, the department grew further, gaining a presence at the university's medical school, as well as establishing a university-owned company called Repromed, offering fertility services. Repromed continued the tradition of putting the profits from the business back into research for the department. In 1988, pathologist and clinician Rob Norman arrived from South Africa to supervise the laboratories, and Caroline Crowther was appointed bringing her expertise in undertaking large randomised trials. Another significant appointment in 1988 was that of a promising science graduate, Sarah Robertson. In the 1990s, the advances in reproductive medicine continued with the race to improve pregnancy rates in IVF. The department was excited by a new technique pioneered in Belgium, where the sperm was directly injected into the egg. Known as intracytoplasmic sperm injection, the department achieved the third pregnancy in the world using this technique. Today, 60% of IVF is done with this sperm uh, injection technique. And what it offered, of course, was a revolution to the males. We, we, uh, here we could begin to treat men with very few sperm. Uh, sometimes they, we had many, well, many cases really where we had more eggs than sperm and yet we could get babies for them. So it was a thriller of a technique. A continuing focus was on the low success rates of IVF in women who were overweight. The Fertility Fitness Lifestyle Program was developed to assist women's health and increase their chances of falling pregnant. In the first program, 14 out of 15 participants became pregnant. Over the next decade or so, we started programs looking at insulin resistance, uh, what happened when people had exercise and good diet, and noted dramatic metabolic changes quite quickly before people had even lost any weight. We started looking at what went on inside the eggs, the fact that fat was being deposited in the eggs and that fat, fat was poisonous to the eggs and that that could be reversed by diet and lifestyle and by some of the common drugs that were used. In 1993, the department was the fifth in the world to achieve births following pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, in this case, for cystic fibrosis. Research was also being undertaken to look at the factors in semen that affect fertility. In 1994, the department gained a presence at the Lyle McEwen Hospital with Paul Duggan's appointment. The following year, the Queen Victoria Hospital closed and the Queen Victoria building at the Women and Children's Hospital opened with the department having a strong presence. In 1998, Gus Decker arrived from the Netherlands. 
as Professor of Obstetrics and Gynaecology at the Lyle McEwen and the Queen Elizabeth Hospitals. The centrepiece at that stage was the Women's Children's Hospital and there was the Queen Elizabeth Hospital with a, to some degree, uncertain future with a lot of research capacity there. Reprimat at that stage was based at Queen Elizabeth Hospital and there was huge uh, lab capacity there. But my task initially was going to be Queen Elizabeth and La McCune. Now La McCune in those years was really like a small country hospital. But I could, uh, I looked at the demographics and the projected growth, etc. And I think, gee, this is going to be one of the leading hospitals. And for me, it was part of the adventure to be part of that building process. Yeah, and that. Uh, but I knew that it was going to be a rough road for the La McCune, which, which it was. But uh, eventually, we got there. In 1999, Rob Norman succeeded Colin Matthews as Professor of Reproductive Medicine. By 2004, the number of babies that had been born from the university's Reproductive Medicine Unit reached 5,000. Another breakthrough in IVF was achieved with Sarah Robertson's research. It focused on how the immune system interacted with the reproductive system. She examined how cytokines, new cell signalling molecules were being used by immune cells and how this might relate to conception. So the first work I did was to consider how adding cytokines to pre-implantation embryos in the culture dish might improve their developmental competence. Most human uh, IVF labs could only get about 35% blastocyst development. We, when we added the recombinant GMCSF to the culture dish, were astounded to see a 70% development of embryos to blastocyst, and we'd never seen, no one had ever seen this rate of development. It was really exciting. It was also slightly scary, because I thought, wow, what have we found here? It's now being used in uh, over 40 countries internationally, which is really exciting, obviously, to have a product in the market and improving the lives and um, health, I guess, of so many couples around the world. In 2006, the disciplines of obstetrics and gynaecology and paediatrics merged to become the School of Paediatrics and Reproductive Health. Professor Julie Owens was appointed the inaugural head of school. Geoffrey Robinson retired in 2006 to be succeeded as head of discipline by Alistair McLennan, followed by Paul Duggan in 2012. The Queen Elizabeth Hospital's maternity ward closed in 2004, with the clinical base of the discipline moving to the Women's and Children's Hospital. In 2006, Repromed was sold by the university, and the idea of forming a dedicated research institute began to take shape. The university has recognised that to have a significant impact worldwide, that it must foster excellence. And by choosing to have institutes, this is a very positive way to do that. And to point somebody like Rob with huge skills of bringing people together and growing an institute, it has given it an enormous start. I would put the concepts behind the Robinson Institute back to two people. One was Mick Guerin, who was business manager of the discipline of ONG at that time and then Julie Owens, who was the head of the school. We would not have the Robinson Institute if it were not for Rob Norman. We had the Research Centre for Reproductive Health, which I think Rob and some others of the scientists here uh, got together and thought, yep, we've got to um, put our hand up for a university centre, we've got the critical mass, we've got the scale of funding from the federal government that really means that this is an area of excellence that the university needs to recognise. Rob then took the next critical step uh, together with uh, some others who supported his vision that this research centre should become an institute. Named in honour of Geoffrey Robinson and under the directorship of Rob Norman, the Robinson Institute was launched in 2008. By focusing on the early stages of life, Research in the Robinson Institute aims to improve the health and well-being of children and families across generations. Its researchers have continued to make groundbreaking discoveries that have translated into clinical practice.
We've just completed a large scale randomised trial in which we've um, involved over 2,200 women in pregnancy um, who were overweight or obese and they were randomised to receive uh, a comprehensive dietary intervention or to receive current standard antenatal care. We know that um, during pregnancy women are particularly receptive um, to changing their lifestyle and doing things that are going to promote health not only for them but also for their baby and I think um, I think the really exciting thing is that we know uh, through a lot of the work from Jeffrey and also from Julie but also others that what happens to a woman during the course of her pregnancy is actually really key in setting up um, long-term pathways and programming what happens to people subsequently, um, so when they're children and when they're, they become adults. The Institute has also progressed fundamental knowledge in reproductive biology to understand and identify genetic variants and how they are affected by lifestyle factors. It's one of the pleasures of being in retirement is to watch that the discipline and the Institute are growing and are successful and that those who were young people are now international leaders of research and are collaborating with other people who I would regard as world leaders in their own topics. I grew up in an age where you could do little for infertility except operate on damaged tubes, etc., and the results were not great. So um, donor insemination programs, IVF programs, uh, sperm injection programs, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis programs were revolutions. It was a thrilling time and yes, I, I certainly describe it as a golden age. I think the, the achievements building from what Lloyd Cox accomplished early on right through have been very much a result of generational change, succession planning being successful, and really recruitment and development of the next generation. The challenge for the Robinson Institute, and for us, the current generation of leaders, is to ensure that the talented people we have recruited, that we are developing, where we can see signs of impact already, have the right resources and the appropriate environment to flourish and grow into that role longer term. Lloyd Cox's vision of world-leading research continues today. The Robinson Institute is recognised for its research excellence, the quality of its teaching, the calibre of its members, and the impact it has in improving the health of children and their families. The Institute continues to evolve under its four research themes of fertility and conception, pregnancy, the early origins of health, and children and adolescents. In September 2013, Sarah Robertson succeeded Rob Norman as the director of the Robinson Institute. I think the bench to bedside focus of this place is, is so important and has really been important in our success. I think it's something that other people are trying to emulate now, but it's also really attractive to people. So especially the young guys, when they come and consider where should they work, when they see that we really can do things that make a difference to people's lives, they say, yeah, I'd like to be part of that. The Robinson Institute has grown hugely in the times it's been in existence. It is phenomenally successful and I have to give credit to the members of the Institute for that. I find it a bit hard to say the Robinson Institute because it sort of says that it's more than I am really. And we're certainly at the cutting edge of identifying novel pathways from uh, the earliest stages of life, preconception onwards, to later health outcomes right across the whole life course. I think that the Robinson Institute really um, brings together the very best of what science can offer to society. It's in an environment where you know you're surrounded by the very best scientists in the world in this area where the, the next thing is going to happen.